Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong will deliver the budget speech in Parliament on Friday. Titled Building Our Shared Future Together, he says that it will serve as the first instalment of plans laid out in the Forward SG roadmap. In a Facebook post, with his budget speech in hand, Mr Wong says that it aims to keep Singapore moving forward and will equip its citizens to realise their fullest potential. He also hopes that it will give more assurance to families and seniors amid a more troubled world. One analyst says that the budget this year, as well as subsequent years, could fundamentally remake Singapore. With the government adopting a more incremental approach, he believes some revisions mentioned in the Forward Singapore report could be fleshed out again tomorrow. I think it, it does signal that, you know, tomorrow's budget is about flexing the, the fiscal muscle, uh, as well as to embark on, on, on significant policy changes to fundamentally remake Singapore's social compact. And I think it's something that we have to, you know, as uh, given that society is undergoing, you know, a variety of stresses and, and the geopolitics means that um, the geopolitical environment has become a lot more uncertain for Singapore. A part of Singapore's social stress, an ageing population. Already, the nation's healthcare spending has nearly tripled over the past decade, from less than $6 billion in the 2013 financial year to around $17 billion in 2022. And with a rapidly ageing population, healthcare is expected to account for the bulk of Singapore's social spending by the year 2030. Now, over the past 10 years, Singapore has been spending more and more on health care, with the health ministry overtaking other top spenders like transport and education in recent years. But where is this money going to? Well, Singapore has also been ramping up major health care facilities amid increased demand from the population. In 2022, close to 90% went towards hiring and training health care professionals or on subsidies to keep those, that health care affordable. As a whole, though, Singapore's health care spending has been kept relatively low against the country's GDP, well below 4% in the past decade. And that is compared to nations like the United Kingdom and the United States, which spend about 8 to 16% of their country's GDP on health care. But as Singapore's population ages, its health care spending could double by 2030. Singapore is projected to become a super-aged nation in just two years, joining the ranks of nations like Japan, Germany and Italy. And to take us through that healthcare spending trend that we're seeing, we have with us in the studio today Dr. Pua Kai Hong. He's adjunct senior research fellow with the Institute of Policy Studies that is at NUS. It's good to see you here. Uh, let's go through, Dr. Pua, uh, exactly what we're seeing with healthcare spending. Uh, about 4% of GDP uh, last year. Are you expecting that figure to be raised upwards at all? And how might we see uh, this impact the budget? If you can give me a guess on just what we might see with healthcare spending. Yeah, I, I think we were underspending uh, because for a long, long time we were about 3% of uh, GNP, you know. And then after the SARS uh, crisis, it went to 3.5. It never came down, you know. And then in recent years, uh, well, when, uh, from the economic perspective, you are not just looking at the uh, demand side, which is predictable with the aging of the population, but also on the supply side, the type of financing and the mix of financing, how we have done that. You know? So Singapore has been spared some of this because we have insisted on the in individual paying part of it through MediSafe. You know? So we have saved it, but with the change uh, now towards uh, comprehensive insurance, from 2015 onwards, you can also see some of the spending going haywire. No? Well, the common complaint is that the healthcare costs are rising as well. Uh, what do you want to see in budget 2024 that perhaps might keep healthcare more affordable? I think in the short term, no, you can't help it because you, uh, Singapore was the first uh, after the COVID uh, uh, pandemic you know, to have a chronic uh, deficit financing but we have, we, have not, uh, we have not done that. 
Okay, the chronic debt uh, uh, financing was actually solved. We are the only country who have done that. That's through MediSafe and through our NIRC type of financing, where twenty percent of our budget has been the, and it was to revise five times. You know, as yes. you know. Uh, so we have avoided that problem, but now in the post-pandemic uh, situation, there has a bit of revenge spending, you know. Right. So it has bounced back. So I would expect it to be about five percent of GNP. So that so that would be to you a significant increase. I mean, we we still want to keep that cost down. Well, it is relative, you know, because then it depends uh, on other countries' the spending. Also depends on the denominator. So when the spending uh, the GMP goes down. I think it is expected that with the the, the uh, uh, impending crisis right now, you know, yeah, uh, most most economies would slow down a bit. Yeah, when it yeah. comes to healthcare, I mean, it, it's difficult to, to put a cap yes, on costs. Exactly. One of the manpower costs as well. Uh, we do have a shortage of nurses. That's one of the key issues. Uh, but it seems to have been sorted out. Uh, we're, we're, we're coping better with it post-pandemic as well. Mm. Uh, we've just hired 5,600 nurses. We needed 4,000. Uh, does it make sense to hire more than you need? Well, actually, I, would, uh, I would say that it's better to err on the side of, uh, of caution because during the pandemic, um, the number who have been registered who are eligible were not coming forward. You know? So even though we have recruited more than it, a lot of it... Um, could be due to attrition, they may not show up or they may go some other sectors or may, may more like the trend towards community care right now, you know. Uh, the emphasis is on prevention yeah. and community care and not the uh, crisis management. Yes, that it's, we have, yeah, it's is important expensive. not to yeah. forget that with even within that sector, within the nursing sector, there tends to be a fair bit of movement as well. Sure. Uh, it, and, and is that why we need more longer-term incentives? I mean, the health minister uh, spoke about those as well, giving bonuses. Is it really necessary? Well, I think it is because uh, there's a worldwide competition for scarce resources, yeah. and including trained nurses, you know. So we don't want to have a situation where they come to Singapore and they get free training, and then they hop over to some other, so, so some other countries. You know? So we may have to institute uh, bonds and maybe... For the better ones, we may have to give them other incentives like permanent residence select selectively. Yeah. What about the range of healthcare facilities that we have here in Singapore? We've seen centres open uh, and specific ones as yeah. well, like the Longevity Centre, as an example, at, at NUS, NUH. Excuse me. Uh, do we need more facilities uh, and and specifically targeted ones? I think in the uh, budget allocation, the problem is uh, scarce resources, uh, including staff, to man some of these facilities. So even though we see there's a need to build these facilities, um, we have problems finding the right expertise and personnel to, to man this. So take, for example, last year, uh, we did uh, the uh, DPM, did promise after SARS uh, that we're going to have a National Institute of Public Health. So we will expect some of this to continue to be spent in these new facilities. But uh, finding the expertise from all over the world, we have to pay them a little better, you know, to, yeah. and then retain them as well in Singapore. Yeah, you, I mean, when it comes to healthcare and sort of addressing the needs of what will become very quickly a super-aged society mm. here in Singapore, mm. uh, we want to be able to throw as much at the problem, because we see it as a problem, but maybe also we can turn that around a little bit, but it, it is a concern. How worried should we be about that fact developing? I think once you have caught up with the advanced countries, so it's not a question of uh, now uh, breaking the spending, you know, because you have caught up, you have to do a lot of research to know the way forward. You know? So what is cost effective and what is not, you don't know. So you will have to experiment. A lot of the money will be going to research as well. Mm. Uh, and, and this region, uh, during the recession, a lot of, um, uh, of our resources have come to Singapore. No? Right. And, and we are getting the best practices here to see how we should develop the healthcare sector. Everybody's talking about digitalization yes. uh, and, and so on you know, well, in the healthcare a, sector. A, a quick final question for you, Dr. Poir, uh, before we let you go. 
Can you give me the top two items on your budget wish list for tomorrow? I think if you go along with what was promised in the uh, Forward Singapore report, no? yeah. uh, we did want to have a, a, a new social compact. And so the emphasis to help those uh, disabled people and to help those older people who fall through the net to be able to uh, pick up the, uh, the taps you know, of this rising cost, I think that's one. And secondly, is to emphasize mental health, you know, because mental health um, uh, patients and the carers and the families are not covered in many of those insurance plans. So I think uh, the, through the taxation system, to the budget system, we are expecting a lot more to be done for mental health as well. Yeah. So broaden protection for very specific yes. key groups. Thank you, Dr. Poa, uh, for coming in this evening. Dr. Poa Kai Hong, the Adjunct Senior Research Fellow with the Institute of Policy Studies at NUS.